Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. I'm absolutely thrilled today to have with me John Sun. John is the founder and CEO of Spring Labs. John, first of all, welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. Yeah, thank you, Tom, for having me on the program. Really excited. John, could you tell us your professional background? Uh, absolutely. So I am the founder and CEO of Spring Labs, and Spring Labs is an AI technology company for financial institutions. We focus primarily on compliance tech as well as CX and operations tech. And my background has been more on the uh, other side of fintech. I've been a part of or founders at fintech lenders for most of my career. So before Spring Labs, I was the uh, co-founder and chief risk officer at Avant, which is a consumer lender and credit card company based in Chicago. We started in 2012. My other two co-founders are still running that business and uh, I have kind of day-to-day moved on to uh, Spring Labs. And really started my career at Innova, where I ran the online retail finance program, as well as their analytics and advanced analytics teams. John, typically when I see someone move from a commercial operation to uh, something like Spring Labs, it's because either they've not been satisfied with the tools they've seen in the marketplace, or they see perhaps a need or an opportunity by the creation of a tool. Does, do either of those apply to you? Certainly, I think a big driver of not starting another lender was really a couple of different things. I think exactly what you mentioned, which is, I think there's just a massive gap for tools within the, especially compliance space for startups, fintechs, traditional FIs. And really a lot of what we're trying to do at Spring Labs is to plug some of those gaps using more modern tech stacks. I think if I were to really recall and, and summarize what we did well, Avant, my previous company, at the very beginning, it was adoption of really cutting edge technologies to give us a competitive edge. But at the same time, that came with a lot of cost. The infrastructure for it wasn't ready. There was a lot of stuff to build and run from the ground up. It was difficult, in other words, to adopt cutting edge technologies. And I think that's what we're trying to do at Spring Labs is to make some of these technologies more adoptable and palatable for mainstream financial institutions so they get the benefit of it right away and can stand out you know, amongst their peers. John, typically we don't see in the compliance realm and whatever sort of flavor of a compliance it might be, a correlation between rising complaints in a vertical and economic challenges. Uh, but my sense is you do see that in your vertical. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? It's a great point. And I think the jury is still out on that. But if you were to look at U.S. credit card default rates as a metric for economic challenges, let's call it. And obviously there's a lot that goes in. But Q2 U.S. credit card default rates were what, like three and a quarter. And that's 11 or 12 consecutive quarters of increases. Obviously, their consumers are showing some strain, some hardship. And delinquent and at-risk accounts are certainly more likely to generate complaints. For no other reason than they're more complex and happy path accounts where everyone's paying as scheduled. And also delinquent accounts just generate more interactions with the customer's financial institution, which in turn creates more opportunities for friction. So I think that's generally why you would see increasing complaint trends alongside increasing economic condition. Why does this lead to perhaps the need for consumers to have greater support? during times like this, rather than leading to greater complaint volumes? Yeah, I think that's exactly along the lines of what a lot of our partners have been really trying to do is to create that additional support for customers, because obviously customers in times of stretch, uh, stress and distress do require additional handholding. They uh, require additional help to make sure that they're staying on track of, of, of their kind of plans. And I think some of the ways that, you know, lenders and other financial institutions are trying to help certainly on the products and making the products a little more accessible and adaptable to changing conditions and changing situations for borrowers. But additionally, I think they've made it a lot easier for customers to tell them what kind of help they need and what's wrong or what's going right. And whereas previously you've seen a lot more mono-channel uh, customer feedback solicitation, like maybe there's a web form or maybe there's something like that. And that's how lenders and financial institutions think about gathering complaints. Now you're seeing uh, a lot more of an omni-channel approach where lenders and financial institutions 
are looking at channels beyond just these formal com- channels, like what forms or regulatory complaints. They're doing a much better job of identifying where they could be helpful to customers in regular everyday content, calls and emails and all of that. And even third-party sources, like I know a lot of lenders are increasingly looking to you know, online sources like Yelp and, and Google and even Reddit to hear about what their customers are trying to tell them. They really have a great perspective, I think, that complaints and compliance should never be seen as a cost center, but as a strategic asset. Frankly, that was the mo- reason I was most excited to explore this subject with you. Can we maybe take some time, you, or you take a, a little bit of a deep dive into why compliance management can be a strategic asset? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that is the evolving way of thinking about complaints handling and compliance. It's not as a cost center, but as an actual window into your customers. And really, there's no better way to learn about how you're doing well or not well other than by your customers telling you what you're, you're doing well and, and not well. And, and complaints are a critical part of that you know, process. And I think if you were to look at the more forward-thinking organizations, they've probably been doing this for a while in terms of trying to capture more usable structured data from the complaints and, and the customer feedback they're getting in order to have that really be a part of a virtual cycle that drives product improvements and product process changes and other training for their agents and all of that. And I think the slower moving organizations still think of it as a cost center, like you said, and the goal of that is to squash costs down as low as possible. And obviously by doing that, you're not getting all of this additional benefit that you could be from one of the most voluntary ways that customers have of telling you what you're doing right or wrong. The, and why I'm so fascinated about this, I have long said that effective compliance equates to more efficient business process, which leads to greater ROI. Is that a message that you find resonates with your customer base or are they just seeing compliance as, oh, we have to do it? I think that message is starting to resonate with a wide swatch of financial services. I I think people have finally woken up to the fact that there there is a treasure trove of information in kind of the complaints that you're getting, but also effective, effective kind of compliance processes across the organization, not just in terms of complaints or, or disputes handling. And the generally, I think what you're seeing is that folks are recognizing that compliance can be a business enabler and a business driver instead of just cost center. And I think that's certainly great for us because what we're bringing is the capability to generate some of that value through better technology, through better data, through better kind of analysis of the data that's coming into your organization. Joe, will I? Bring that message to a compliance professional. Typically, I'm preaching to the choir and they believe it, even if they don't understand how the data shows it. But one thing they struggle with is how to take that message to a CFO, to someone who's more quantitative oriented. Uh, Have you been in a situation where you try to help a CTO, a CISO, a compliance officer, whoever your direct client is, maybe make the pitch internally? so they can get the resources to move to a much more proactive approach? I think that does come up quite a bit. Like you said, really being able to demonstrate the value of kind of effective compliance tooling and and frameworks. And I think the way that you can do that successfully is really through just hard verifiable data by showing what are the business improvements or, or different decision points that you would have as a result of access to this data versus not having access to the data. And I think there's quite a few different types of insights that you can can be gleaned from the complaint process or the compliance process as a whole. For example, I, I think a lot of institutions are starting to do trended data, showing what's changing across the organization uh, on the macro level over a medium time horizon of kind of months and quarters. And it shows whether the process changes that you're making or the tools that you're adopting are having a effect or gradual improvement to address some of the more common issues in kind of compliance management um, and doing that by driving different decisions, by driving kind of different training, different processes, different product and technology changes, that sort of thing. And I think a lot of the more forward-thinking organizations are looking at and benefiting from this trended data. I think the other side of it is there are some like very real instances where having effect 
compliance controls and effective data around compliance can allow you to make massively better decisions for very specific cases. I call that idiosyncratic insights is essentially can having more effective compliance processes help you identify very idiosyncratic business changes or technology changes in a short period of time that prevent you from, you know, propagating error or making a much bigger mistake and thus really enabling business innovation. John, on the firm's website, you have, I don't want to say a person, but an entity perhaps called Zanko, and he's the intelligent AI co-pilot for financial institutions. Are you and um, Spring Labs able to bring AI as a tool to help read the data, to see the patterns in rake leaves, or... Does your AI tool help the compliance professional to understand that or find that really the golden nuggets or perhaps is it both or maybe even something different? I think we always take a human first approach to building AI tools for, especially for the compliance world. I think there's just so much unique value that humans in the process can bring to better understanding some of the root causes to working with internal teams to collect this. So a lot of our tools are, are really geared towards how do we make your compliance team more efficient? How do we make your compliance team more accurate? And to help generate um, some more actionable kind of insights from the data that you're already getting. So it, it's very much a tool that kind of you know, augments your existing human compliance functions and, and, and makes them more effective through augmenting them with these types of AI tools. What are some of the AI tools that you and your team have been able to develop? I think our focus on the compliance side is uh, along a couple of different dimensions. So I think if you were to think back to the complaints handling or disputes handling process at most lenders or financial institutions, you're generally starting with a customer contact to a customer service agent. And the customer service agents have a lot of jobs of which one of them is to detect when a customer conversation has entered the realm of a complaint. And they're expected to be able to identify complaints and disputes, they're expected to be able to categorize them, they have to write up a remediation summary and be able to properly escalate ones that need to be escalated. And that's all kind of work that is somewhat disruptive to the workflow of a customer service agent that has a million and one of the things that they're working on. So one of the capabilities of, of the platform is to automatically scan through your customer conversations, be they voice calls or emails or live chat logs, and, and just passively tell the organization which ones fit your definition of being a complaint and which ones fit the definition of being a, a dispute and be able to properly categorize those and log them and escalate them to, as necessary to, to second line teams. And I think the other you know, challenge that we saw for is on the second line team, if you think about the, again, normal flow of a customer contact, you call customer service, you're like, hey, something's wrong. Customer service logs as a complaint, escalates to the second line. Second line now has to go through and review all of this material. Did first line handle the complaint properly? They remediate the property, label a property. They're basically redoing all of the work from first line again. So we have tools in kind of this AI compliance kind of toolkit that allows us to streamline the work for second line compliance so they can spend less time reading and labeling and cataloging complaints and spend more time understanding the details, doing root cause analysis and potentially working with teams and internal and external stakeholders to implement fixes and replace and, and uh, fixes and, and improvements to process so that fewer complaints get generated in the future. John, on your website, you have three AI based tools at least three that I came across, compliance assist, agent assist, and customer assist. And I wanted to go back to your remarks around properly categorizing an issue that might come in. In my type of compliance, we would call that triage. And although it sounds relatively straightforward, categorize it correctly, it turns out that is the one that really gives the front line sometimes some of the most difficulty and not intentionally, of course, but they will misassign it. Something that is serious may go to an area or for not flagged for immediate review. Conversely, something not serious might get flagged, sent up the chain, and a lot of resources are spent determining this was really not that serious. But it all starts with that first 
initial categorization, it sounds like from your description, you're able to bring an AI tool to really help that. Did I, is that a fair assessment of what I heard from you? Yeah, exactly. And I think you're absolutely right. Categorization is the first step of this journey. If you get the categorization wrong, all sorts of things are going to go wrong down the road. And the phenomenon that you're describing, over-reporting, under-reporting, those are all things that kind of stem from improper first-line categorization. And I think generally what we've seen is that despite kind of the best efforts of the lenders, at the end of the day, this isn't the only job that customer service agents have. So as a result, in their dealing with everything else that's going on, their, their accuracy rates and effective rates, this rates for that categorization are fairly low. Based on data that we've seen from a number of different lenders and financial institutions, we'd estimate that accuracy of probably call it 60 to 65%. As a result, if everything else stems from the categorization, you're getting the categorization wrong a third of the time, then certainly the downstream activities are going to be less effective as well. So I think I also heard you say a little bit earlier that there's actually a lot of data in customer input whether it's a complaint, whether it's a something else, and that the specifically the Spring Labs tool allows a company to data mine in a way perhaps they weren't able to before. Could you expand on that and how those insights can actually improve your overall business process efficiency? Yeah, absolutely. As complaints are probably one of the most difficult types of data to handle. It's unstructured conversational text data. So anyone that kind of works with data would be able to identify with this, which is unstructured conversational text data. It's very difficult to make useful. So you're already going to be able to structure that data. And I think that's where the AI components of kind of our, our platform come in, is to be able to take that unstructured conversational text data and create meaningful structures from it. And this is being done today already. Like when you ask a customer service agent, to create a labeling or a categorization for a complaint, you're essentially asking them to use human intelligence to classify, to structure unstructured conversation. They're hearing on the phone from the customer what's wrong, or they're reading an email, or they're chatting with the customer, they're processing all of that information, and they're turning that unstructured data into structured data in the form of categories and, and tags. And again, the challenge with that is there's a limited capability for a individual customer service agent to be able to do that in the sense that if I asked a customer service agent to tell me which one of these 10 categories a particular customer conversation belonged in, I'd probably get a pretty good result. If I asked a customer service agent to tell me which one of 50 categories this conversation belonged in, I'd get a much worse result because they'd have to think about what the difference between these two very similar sounding categories are. And they wouldn't be able to do it in a consistent way. And two different customer service agents would do it in two different ways, which kind of creates this data mismatch and data gap that makes the data less useful because it's less consistent across your entire organization. So as a result, there's a trade-off between accuracy and granularity. The more granular the data, the more actionable it is, and the more accurate the data, the more useful it is. But unfortunately, you have to choose one of the two. Do you want more granular data or do you want more accurate data? just because of that kind of human limitation in data structuring. And that's, I think, where AI, especially techniques and the solutions that come in the would bring the market would be able to do is to help you avoid having to make that decision. By using AI in conversational intelligence, you're able to generate consistent, reliable, accurate, and more importantly, granular insights about the customer conversations that are coming in. And from these granular labelings and granular insights, you're able to learn much more about what's going right and what's going wrong with customers interacting with your product or service. John, obviously, it's obvious to me, at least, you could sit down with a chief compliance officer, with a CISO, with a CTO, probably with a CFO or CEO, and have as in-depth a discussion on these topics as they might want. But what I wanted to ask, are you starting to see boards paying more attention to this types of information, large unstructured data that people like you in Spring Labs can bring tools to data mine, or is that something that's really not happening as yet? I think boards are limited by their imagination as far as the art of the possible, if you will. Uh, I think if you're a board and you're used to seeing certain types of reporting, 
that's the type of reporting you continue you expecting to see. But you know, I will say when we've taken this technology to boards and to management and kind of shown them what outputs we can generate and what kind of insights we can generate, we've generally had extremely positive responses. I think this type of information is what kind of boards and compliance committees want to see. But I think certainly they're also acutely aware of the trade-offs that would have to be made operationally to make this possible for them. So now that there's avenue to make it possible, I think we're going to see more and more demand for this type of data from oversight bodies as well as sports. So I want to ask you to maybe put on your prognostication hat and where do you see both Spring Labs and really the fintech arena and the use of AI, maybe I, I hate to say five years down the road because mm -hmm. I'm not sure anyone can look five years down the road, at least in this arena, but where do you see sort of the next iteration or two that you hope to be able to bring to your customer base? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if I'm going to be on the money on, the, on this one, but certainly happy to have Hazard the guest here. I, I think what is certain is that the use of AI is here to stay. And it's not AI as in like Terminator, it's AI as in tools like the ones that we built that make your average everyday compliance agents and compliance analysts more effective and more efficient at their job. Certainly, I think you're starting to see the advancement of AI and the integration of AI into products across the compliance sphere. What we do obviously centers around complaint and dispute and issues handling, but you're also seeing the same technologies being applied to vendor management and loan conformance testing and like marketing content reviews and AML, KYC and PSA, SARS remediations and, and all of these types of things. So I, I think what's going to happen within the next couple of years is you're going to start to see compliance teams that it, are going to adopt stacks that look like kind of very AI native product stacks that help improve accuracy and, and effectiveness and efficiency across all of their operations, across all of these verticals. And I think at some point you probably see some consolidation in this space as far as like platforms that now start to offer more than one of these capabilities. And certainly I think that's where our roadmap is, is headed is to be able to bring uh, solutions for a variety of problems to the same interface so that you only have to integrate into kind of a tool once rather than having to integrate into multiple tools to get the different pieces of functionality that you need. John, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode. But before we leave, I wanted to ask you if our listeners wanted to connect with you or get any more information on Spring Labs or really any of the topics you've touched on, what might be the best place or places for them to go? Yeah, absolutely. All of the information that I talked about is available on our website at springlabs.com. Uh, if you go to springlabs.com slash innovation, you can book uh, a meeting directly with me. I'm happy to talk through anything compliance or AI related or, or even if it's unrelated to, uh, to Spring Labs product as far as I've had conversations about adoption strategy and AI transformation and what are things to look out for in kind of AI projects and PLCs happy to have any and all of those conversations with the listeners today. Thank you so much for being on the show. John, I thoroughly enjoyed myself and I hope we can continue this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you again.